Hello, everyone. I'm Ellen Beal, president of Saratoga Book Festival. It is my pleasure to welcome you to a night of fiction writers presented by Saratoga Pride in a partnership with Saratoga Book Festival. You're in for a great program. The folks at Bold Strokes Books, one of the world's largest independent publishers of quality LGBTQ literature, bring together four of their authors to talk about their award-winning fiction. Senior editor Sandy Lowe, an author in her own right, moderates what is sure to be a lively conversation between Radcliffe, Ashley Bartlett, Anne Shade, and Nathan Burgoyne. A big thank you to Saratoga Pride for inviting us to be part of the Pride Reads programming. These are exciting times for us at Saratoga Book Festival, as well as Saratoga Pride. We will be holding our first ever live event on October 15th through 17th this year in venues in downtown Saratoga Springs. We hope you can join us. To find out more about our programs, uh, please head on over to our Facebook page when you get a chance at Saratoga Book Festival or find us online at saratogabookfestival.org where we'll start announcing our author lineup next month. But enough about that. Before we start, I'd like to first introduce Cindy Swaba, one of the founders of Saratoga Pride, without whom this event would not be happening. Cindy, over to you. Well, thank you, Ellen. You're very generous in your introduction. It's, it's really the book festival who came to us and it's a lovely partnership. Um, I wanna just say hello from Saratoga Pride. Uh, we are a 15 year old or so organization that has been increasing the visibility of the LGBTQ uh, community for our uh, Saratoga Springs and the surrounding area. We are coming to the close of our Pride Week, um, 10 days or nine days left. We have a couple of activities left and you can find those on saratogapride.com. We are very fortunate to be part of a welcoming community. And uh, if you haven't seen it already, we have uh, recently painted our Pride Crosswalk which is uh, beautiful colors on Spring Street in Saratoga. Um, and I just encourage you to go to saratogapride.com and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Ellen. Wonderful, thank you for that, Cindy. And the crosswalk is beautiful. It's fast become a, a really popular part of Saratoga. So good work, everybody. So now, um, I want to just mention to you, of course, we'd love to get your questions. We invite you to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And our good friend Purdy from Saratoga Book Festival will be watching for those questions. And uh, we will promise to try to get to everybody by the end of the evening, if not times in between. Uh, so now without further ado, I would like to welcome Sandy. Uh, Sandy, as I mentioned before, is a senior editor at um, uh, uh, Bold Strokes Books and an author in her own right. And she'll be leading us in a great conversation this evening. Uh, so Sandy, take it away. Thank you so much, Ellen. We are so excited to be here. Bold Strokes Books is local. We're in Cambridge, New York. so. I know Saratoga so well, and this is so much fun to be part of a local event. Um, we really appreciate your support of the LGBTQ community and of Bold Strokes Books. So our panel tonight is going to be split between um, readings from these wonderful authors' books. And after the readings, we will have a Q&A session. So as mentioned, please do put your questions in the Q&A box. We are going to start with a reading from Radcliffe. Radcliffe is the publisher of Bold Strokes Books, author of over 65 romance novels, and she is a three-time winner of the Lambda Literary Award and a 2021 Advocate Woman of the Year. Rad, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book that you're reading from and start reading whenever you're ready. Thanks, Sandy. And I too am very happy to be here. Um, I grew up in Hudson Falls, and um, this feels a lot like coming home, being in Cambridge. And I'm delighted to be able to do this reading and to join you tonight. I am going to be reading from Unrivaled. Hopefully you can see that. That is a May release for me. 
Unrivaled is a standalone romance set in the world of the Philadelphia Medical Center, a series of related novels that began with Faded Love. Each features a new romance while also continuing stories of some of the secondary characters. This book, Unrivaled, follows passionate rivals, which introduced a new group of young doctors in training and follows their adventures in high stakes emergency medicine and love. This series and the scene that I'm reading features the main characters, Zoe Cohen, a senior surgery resident, and Declan Black, a new ER attending with a mysterious past. They have grabbed a quick lunch and carried it outside for a break from the nonstop pressures of trauma care and surgery. I realized tonight when I was re reviewing the scene that when I chose the scene this morning, I didn't think about the fact that when I wrote it, the park in the middle of Saratoga Springs was the inspiration for the setting. And I think you may recognize why as I read it. The park was a short block away from the hospital and Deck led Zoe down a wandering grassy path to a pond dotted with white flowering lily pads in the center. Zoe sighed, is this actually real? Deck took a deep breath and felt something very close to relaxation flooding through her. The tension she barely ever registered between her shoulders made itself known by its sudden absence. It is, and it's easy how quickly we forget it's here. I know, God, it smells good out here. Zoe glanced at Deck. Thanks for this. Zoe's soft voice flowed over Deck's skin like a warm hand. Come, sit over here. Deck caught Zoe's hand and guided her to a wooden bench on the far side of the pond. A short grassy slope led down to the water's edge where a flock of ducks rested on the shore and swam in the shallows. She took off her lab coat and laid it over the back of the bench. Zoe did the same. So, Zoe said when Deck handed her a sandwich from the bag she'd been carrying, what's your favorite thing to do when you're not at the hospital working? Well, I like to come here and watch the ducks. What about you, Deck said as they ate. You're gonna laugh. After the ducks? I don't think so. I like to knit, Zoe said. Aha. Uh -huh. Deck pointed a finger. You started knitting when you knew you wanted to be a surgeon because it improves your dexterity. Zoe's eyes widened. That's me. Not that I get all that much of a chance to knit these days. So what do you knit? Deck asked. A lot of scarves. I'm glad I'm here and not in Texas then, Deck said, because then I wouldn't get the chance to ask for one. I'm glad you're here too. Zoe reached out as if to take Deck's hand before abruptly pulling back. I'll put you on my gift list. So tell me about the ducks. When I was a med student, Deck said, stretching her legs out and resting one arm along the top of the bench, I used to sneak out here as often as I could during the day just to watch them for a while. Yeah? Zoe asked, balling up the paper the steak sandwich had come in and sliding it into the paper bag. Somehow I can't see you sneaking away to do anything. Are you trying to say that you think I'm stodgy? Deck said with mock insult. No, but, well, this is awkward. I heard you were a star, Zoe said. Stars usually don't break any rules. I don't know about being a star, Deck said, and I don't think it's really rule breaking as long as you're getting all your work done, right? True, Zoe said, although most of the time when anybody's got a spare minute, they find some place to sleep. Zoe shifted on the bench until her gaze caught Deck's. I bet you didn't tell anybody what you were doing. Oh yeah, Deck murmured, watching the sunlight play through Zoe's hair. Why do you think that? Because it was private, Zoe whispered, and I don't think you talk very much about private things. How come you know that? Deck caught a strand of Zoe's hair as the breeze blew it across Zoe's cheek and tucked it behind her ear. Her thigh pressed Zoe's, and it happens to be true. I listen to what you don't say, Zoe said. That's a little scary. Deck's chest tightened. Fifteen minutes together, and already she was in deep water, maybe over her head. And the weirdest thing was, she didn't care. Her heart hammered against her ribs. Zoe's face was inches away. What else do you see about me, Deck asked. Zoe edged a few inches nearer until her shoulder bumped Deck's fingers. Something hurt you, and I'm sorry, so sorry for that. Deck shook her head. It's not what you think. How do you know what I think, Zoe asked. 
Could it possibly be that I'm right and you don't want me to know? Zoe's tone was gentle, but Deck wasn't fooled. Zoe could read her, and that left her half worried and half grateful. You're very, very good at discovering what other people need, Deck said. Is that a bad thing? Zoe asked. I wouldn't have said it was good for me, Deck confessed. Before, before, Zoe asked. Before you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Rad. And obviously, Thanks, as Andy. a hired surgeon, you definitely know how to write a medical romance. All righty. Next up, we have Anne Shade. Anne is the author of three romance novels and loves writing romances about women who love women, featuring characters who are strong, beautiful, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And why don't you tell us a little bit about the book you're reading from and start reading whenever you're ready. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Ann Shade. I'm reading from my current book, Masquerade. It's a 1920s historical that takes place during the Harlem Renaissance in New York. And the characters are Dinah Hampton, who is a nurse by day and a chorus girl in a um, bootleg nightclub at night. And Celine Montre, who is a former um, Creole debutante from New Orleans. Um, both have come to Harlem for different reasons. Um, Dinah is to escape um, the, the racism in the South and to try and bring her family up North. And Celine to escape a scandal um, that drove her family from their home in New Orleans. Uh, the scene I'm about to read is Celine and Dinah um, are ha having dinner with their aunts, um, both of which are gay. Um, Celine, Dinah's aunt is living with her life partner running a boarding house in Harlem and uh, Celine's aunt runs a dress shop and they're all getting together for an evening just so that Celine and Dinah can kind of have some time to be themselves. Dinah grasped Celine's hand and pulled her toward her. I've missed you. Celine took a step closer to Dinah. I've missed you too. You're all I can think about. Dinah grasped Celine's other hand. If what happened, what is happening between us is a lot to accept right now, just tell me now. Celine's soft lips were on Dinah's, cutting short whatever she was going to say. The kiss was so achingly tender, it filled Dinah's heart with joy. The spell was broken by the sound of her aunt calling them from the dining room. They ended their kiss slowly. A moment passed before Dinah took a step back. We better go in before my aunt comes looking for us. Dinah took Celine's hand and led her to the dining room. We thought it might do you two some good to be together without worrying about having to hide what you're feeling, Aunt Jo said. Also to offer some sage advice from a few old ladies, Celine's aunt gave them a wink. This is not an easy life, Jo said, especially when your family wants another life for you. Dinah knew the comment was directed at Celine from the look of guilt Dinah saw on Celine's face. She must have realized it also. Dinah looked over at her aunt in annoyance. Don't give me that look, child. We're all family here. There's no need to be all closed mouth about this. The sooner you get things out in the open, the better. Josephine is right, Olivia said, looking at Celine from across the table. I was the oldest and it was expected of me to marry first. For several years, our parents despaired ever finding a match for me. I found fault with every prospect, prospective husband that paraded before me. They finally gave up when rumors that I was having an affair with the son of a French aristocrat began to circulate. A rumor I had conveniently started, she grinned mischievously. The rumor assisted with deterring any further interest suitors as well as any further interested suitors, as well as to prove to my young aristocrat's family, who worried their son's predilection for young Negro boys would deny them heirs, that there might be hope for him to marry after all. To my parents' relief, I accepted an apprenticeship under a family friend who was a seamstress traveling to France. I was no longer a worry for them, able to live the life I chose, and they were able to focus their attention on your mother, who was more than happy to fulfill her role as the dutiful daughter. Unfortunately, Celine, as the only child, you don't have the option I have of having a younger sister to carry the burden that you don't wish to. If you continue down the road, I and these wonderful ladies have chosen, Olivia indicated Joe and Fran, Sooner or later, you'll have to choose between breaking your parents' hearts to be with the woman you will never be able to love openly 
of breaking the heart of the woman you love to fulfill your familial obligations to your parents. Could you live with making Dinah, with making Celine choose? Joe asked Dinah. I love Fran with all my heart, but I'll live the rest of my life feeling some guilt over knowing her choosing to be with me is the reason her family won't have anything to do with her. Wordlessly, Fran reached over and grasped Joe's hand. Why are you doing this? Dinah asked. I thought you wanted us to be together. You practically threw Celine at me at the masquerade, she said to Olivia, then looked at Joe. And you're always telling me to follow my heart and that we can't always help with the lo who the Lord chooses for us to love. Now you all sound like you're trying to prevent us from being together. Celine grasped Dinah's hand. They're not trying to keep us from being together. They're trying to help us realize that we'll be facing it, what we'll be facing if we decide to be together. They want us to be sure we're ready for such a life, if I'm ready for such a life. Dinah squeezed Celine's hand. I haven't asked you to choose. All I ask is that we have this one step at a time and see where it leads us. And if it leads us to having to make a choice, Celine asked. We'll deal with that role when we come to it, Dinah said. Dinah, we only said what we said because we love you both and don't want to see either of you hurt, Joe said. I understand you're trying to help, but we know what we're doing. You don't have to worry about us. There was a tense moment of silence before Fran picked up her fork and said, I don't know about you all, but I've been waiting all day for that peach cobbler sitting in the kitchen. So if you're done advising the young folks, I'm going to go ahead and finish eating so I can have some. With the tension broken and chuckles all around the table over Fran's enthusiastic eating, everyone else followed suit. Although the remainder of the meal was spent discussing Dinah's new job at Harlem Hospital and other topics, what their aunt said weighed heavily on Dinah's heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. I Thanks. think that's so poignant as a historical novel and I think also speaks to what some of us go through currently in our lives. So yes. very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have Nathan Burgoyne. Nathan is a tall queer guy who writes mostly shorter queer fiction. He's a Lambda Literary Award finalist and the author of four speculative fiction novels, a handful of novellas, and a dozen short stories. Nathan, please tell us a little bit about your most recent work and take it away whenever you're ready. I'm actually going to be reading from um, a book, uh, sorry, novella called Village Fool, um, which I jokingly refer to as my disaster cute. Um, so uh, the scene you're gonna be reading or uh, hearing is um, a, a young man named Owen, who's very shy and reserved, He's had a crush on his physiotherapist um, for, for months. Um, and a friend of his plays a prank on him on April Fool's Day and changes a whole bunch of the contacts in his, uh, in his phone. So he has unknowingly spent the morning uh, sending sort of sexy flirty texts about his crush to his crush, Toma, rather than his friend, Felix. Um, and it's all about to hit the head and he's it's all going to come to disaster in, in this moment. So any text he thinks he was sending to Felix, he's actually sending to Toma and vice versa. Owen stepped into bittersweets and took a second to wipe his feet on the mat. Of course he was early. He had 20 whole minutes before Toma would arrive, which was more than enough time to work himself up into a complete knot of anxiousness. His phone pinged, a text from Felix. Are we still good for four at bittersweets? Owen blinked. He read it again. Had he double booked? He didn't remember agreeing to meet with Felix, but then again, this morning, he hadn't been at his mental best. Or maybe they'd agreed to hang out sometime last week. He wasn't sure. Should he tell him? He bit his lip and blew out a breath. Felix might tease him, but he'd be happy for him too. I'm afraid I've got a date with the world's best chest at four. Brain check? The little gray dots bounced on the screen. You're funny. I hope the chest doesn't disappoint. Owen checked his email, scrolled social media, and even tried to listen to his audiobook for a few minutes. Finally, when there was only five minutes to go, he realized if he didn't do something, he was going to flip out. So he pulled out his contact list and drafted a quick text to Toma. Hey, I'm a bittersweet's a little early. I'm always early, don't rush. And it's wet and cold out there. What kind of coffee do you like? I'll have it waiting and ready for you. He read and reread the message, trying not to overthink and failing miserably. It was casual, right? Thoughtful, but not needy? Or was it presumptive? He should add an emoji. A smiley face. No. The mug of coffee. Yeah. He blew out a breath and hit send on the text before he changed his mind. We were meeting for coffee. Ordering Toma a drink before he arrived was totally within the realm of normal. 
It took a little while for the three dots to appear. Not that Owen was watching, waiting for it to happen or anything. Okay, that's exactly what he was doing. They appeared, vanished, appeared again, vanished. Owen reread his message. Had he come off strange? Had he managed to make this awkward before Toma even got here, which would be a new record even for him? Finally, a text appeared. Call me. Well, that didn't sound like a good thing. Maybe Toma was about to cancel. It was possible something came up. Or maybe he thinks I'm a complete freak and is trying to bail. Owen tapped the call icon and held the phone to his ear. This was fine. Stuff happened. Come clean. You're bringing him coffee at work now or what? Because that is a great in for asking him out. Owen frowned. Felix? Ha! April Fools! It was Felix. Why do you have Toma's phone? Dude, I don't have his phone. I had your phone this morning. Owen didn't get it. I, I called Toma. No, you called me. I edited a bunch of your contact names. You edited Owen's stomach clenched. You did what? Did you text Silas? Because if you texted Silas, you were totally texting your foster mom. Felix, when I texted you, who was I texting? This couldn't be happening. The physical trainer of your dreams? Why? Wait, did you text him? Oh my God, you did. What did you say to him? You have to tell me. Was it Owen hung up? He stared at the screen for a horrified moment and tapped his way to the text messages he thought he'd been sending to Felix. He hit the contact information and brought up the entry. He didn't recognize the phone number. Who recognized anyone's phone number these days? But the email associated with the contact was right there on the screen. Toma Popescu at villagebody.positive.ca. Every text he'd sent Felix, he'd been sending to Toma. His phone started ringing. Toma, the screen said, but he knew better now. You have no idea what you've done, Owen said. Whoa, Owen, is everything okay? Okay? Oh, wow, no, a world of no. Owen hung up again. Then he saw the clock. Oh, God, Toma would be here any second. The texts he'd sent repeated in his head. It's way less creepy to ogle hot cupcakes through a mirror. The thighs, the thighs would make me risk anything. I had to finish boring ass exercises without any views of his amazing ass. I've got a date with the world's best chest. He was going to throw up. He was absolutely going to throw up right in the middle of Bittersweets. Owen grabbed his coat. He managed the zipper after two attempts when the door to Bittersweets opened. He looked up, mortified that he was too late, but embarrassment shifted to anger when he saw a wet Felix standing there. What happened? You asshole. To his utter humiliation, his eyes welled up with tears. He swiped his face with one hand. You absolute asshole. He was not going to cry right now. He was too angry to cry. Oh my God, Felix said, taking a step forward. Owen? The door opened again. Thomas smiled at Owen for about half a second or so, then frowned, looking between him and Felix. Is everything okay? Felix stared at Toma, mouth open. There, Owen said, pointing at Toma. That's what happened. You complete asshole. Why wouldn't his brain give him another insult? What's going on, Toma said. It was a joke, Owen said. He stared at the ground. I I'm so sorry. A joke, Toma said. Felix, staring back and forth, said, oh, oh, shit. Owen pushed past them both and ran out the door into the ring. Gosh, every time I hear this, my heart just breaks. <laughs> I'm so anxious just hearing it. Gosh, the friends with good intentions that just ends with trouble. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Last but certainly not least, we have award-winning author Ashley Bartlett, who has written eight novels, including the Dirty Sex, Money, and Power trilogy and the Cash Braddock series. She is also an editor here at Bold Strokes Books. Ash, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book you're reading from and start reading whenever you're ready. All right. So I'm going to be reading from Cash Braddock today, which is the first in the Cash Braddock series. Um, the final book just came out. So per the cover, Cash just wants to hang with her cat, fall in love, and deal drugs. What's the problem with that? Uh, Cash and her buddy Nate are prescription drug dealers, and this scene is them at a house party. A hipster kid opened the door. He would have been a prep type in my day, but 10 years of trends had done nothing good for his style. Too tight button down, too tight jeans, haircut reminiscent of the Victorian era. I knew the kid, but I could never remember his name. Something woefully 90s and forgettable. Pacey, Bailey. Cash, Nate, you made it! 
as if we were friends. I shook his hand, he nodded and dismissed me. Hey Dawson, Nate shook his hand just hard enough to show who was stronger. You always have great whiskey, how can we pass it up? I managed not to roll my eyes. This was one of Nate's talents, talking to douchey guys in their own language. The kid nearly jumped in excitement. We were just gonna do a tasting, you want in? Later, definitely. Gotta unload our pockets first, you know? Nate nodded at his messenger bag. Totally, well come on in. Dawson melted away in the direction of his cheap whiskey tasting and we moved into the living room. By unspoken agreement, Nate found a wall to post up on while I made my way to the back of the house. In the backyard, I found a keg and more drunk college kids. A girl approached as soon as she saw me. Hey, you're cash, right? That's me. I heard you got Adderall. Her eyes shone, youthful, dumb. Yes, for her, I definitely had Adderall. We negotiated a price 20% higher than I charged my regulars. She gave me some cash from her cleavage. I should have gone for 30%. And I gave her a bag of blue pills. Parties were nice because I didn't have to be nearly as discreet. In fact, blatant tended to earn higher revenue. It made me more approachable. And at a party like this, I didn't need to worry about cops. The kids were all so young that anyone older than 25 was as obvious as, well, me. After I'd done the backyard for an hour, Nate and I swapped. I wandered through the kitchen and was thankful I wasn't drinking. Nothing looked clean. This was why Nate was the party guy. His tolerance was higher. I was much better at peddling subpar organic produce with a side of Oxy or Xanax. Housewives loved me. I followed an intoxicated couple toward the front of the house. He tripped and she pushed him upright. He grabbed her ass for balance, I'm sure. Her heel caught on the perfectly restored hardwood and they stumbled into a wall. Alcohol was not an attractive drug. Across the living room, I caught sight of a woman who very much did not belong. She was my age, maybe a couple of years older. Her dark hair caught the glow of the dull lights placed throughout the room. She disappeared behind a group of wrestling boys, then reappeared in the mouth of the hallway leading to the back of the house. With a final glance around the room, she drifted away. She was looking for someone. I wanted to be that someone. I ducked into the hallway, she wasn't there. When I got to the backyard, Nate started to approach me, but I waved him off. She was sitting on the retaining wall, holding up the long dead garden. She had her feet stretched out on the cracked patio. She was wearing boots and comfortably tight jeans. Her hair was long by my standard, cropped between her ears and chin. You look as lost as I feel, I sat next to her. That obvious, huh? She smiled. My baby sis and I were supposed to hang out tonight. She brought me here and ditched me, which she has done 1,000 million times. So really, I should have seen it coming. She tugged at the collar of her checked shirt, loosened her tie more. She sounds like a peach, I said. She's much more charming when she's not present, trust me. I'm cash braddock. I held out my hand and she took it. Laurel Collins. About four seconds after the appropriate time to let go, I released her hand. So Cash, how did you end up at this sad affair? Wingman meets third wheel. I've been ditched and now I think I need better friends. May I suggest friends who don't date 20 year olds? I laughed, noted. Any chance I could interest you in a drink? Somewhere legal where we don't get a lecture on home brewing? Also somewhere where no one would come up and ask me for drugs. That was more second date material. You're reading my mind here, Laurel stood. Do you need to tell your friend that you're leaving? As tempted as I am to abandon him, yeah. I should probably give him a heads up, you? Know? You know, I think this will be an excellent lesson for my sister. She can walk home. I laughed. She was kind of a dick. I liked it. Are you driving, I asked. Yeah, I'm a couple blocks away. Uh, me too, do you know the depot? Little place next to Badlands, she asked. That's the one, meet you there in 20. I look forward to it. Her mouth twitched like she was biting a grin. I watched her walk away. She had a fantastic walk, like she knew where she was going. I wished I had that knowledge. Thank you. I love that. That's gotta be one of the most original me cutes ever. <laughs> Takes me back to my college party days. Oh no. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So we um, are up to the Q&A segment of our panel. If you have questions for our panelists, please do pop them in the Q&A box. And we are, um, we have a promo code for a sale tonight. If you have any interest in the books written by these amazing authors, the links to those are in the chat roll. Okay, so I would like to start with a little bit of info about 
Bold Strokes books. Rad, could you tell us a little bit about BSB and our mission? Sure. Um, kind of in a in a nutshell here. Um, BSB was founded in 2004. So we are celebrating our 17th anniversary this July. As many of as many of the authors know, we started out with one author, which was me. And in the years that followed, we have added to our list over 200, almost 250 authors who have contracted with us and published books over the years. We presently publish approximately 120 new titles every year. We distribute our books throughout the world in every format, including eBooks and paperback books, audiobooks now. And we've just recently um, are negotiating for some of our content to be made into interesting games that are being played on mobile devices. Look at Nathan, he likes that. <laughs> um, our mission at the beginning has not changed, although publishing has changed a lot in recent years in terms of how we develop our content, how we deliver our content, and the message that's contained in our content, I think has changed over the years, but our desire has always been to write LGBTQ fiction for the queer community that creates a positive affirming view of our life, which allows us to see ourselves on the page, to see some of our dreams and desires, as well as some of our sort of passions, drives and needs, sometimes our anger, who we are is in the pages of our books, and that's why we're here. And my personal mission in starting the company was not only to make sure that those books got to every reader everywhere in the world, but that we were able to support our authors in that venture to help them develop their craft, create their works, and make sure they got to their readers. So that, that's kind of who we are and why we've been here every day. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we just heard a little bit from Rad about why BSB does what we do. I would like to ask you guys why you as authors write LGBTQ fiction. Anne, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I write LGBTQ fiction to be able to see myself um, in stories that I've not been able to see um, too much. Um, that's why most of my characters, well, all of my main characters are at um, BIPOC characters, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, because I spent so much time when I first started reading Les Fiction not finding or not seeing myself in the stories. And so I write to be able to share that with others who feel the same way. I love that. And we're so glad that the BIPOC community is getting some of the elevation of their voices that they've deserved for so long. Nathan, how about you? Why do you write LGBTQ fiction? Um, I jokingly call it time travel, um, but mm. it's very similar to what Anne said. Um, when I was younger, some of those books existed. And in fact, a lot of those books existed um, that had characters somewhat like me, but um, there was such strong gatekeeping in the 80s and 90s that there was no way they were going to get into my hands. Um, so I, I, when I write, I, I try to write the books I wish I could have found and read when I was younger. Um, and I figure every new book that comes out there just increases the chance that some queerling somewhere gets to find the book they need when they need it. Great. I love that. Queerling. Gonna have to use that. <laughs> Ashley, how about you? Why do you write LGBTQ fiction? So um, I am younger. This is shocking. And <laughs> I had the luxury of growing up with specifically Radcliffe and in general, a wealth of queer fiction and also parents who were very supportive. So when my mom said, fill the Amazon cart and I'll order books, back when Amazon was just books, um, there was my mom ordering Radcliffe's backlist. Um, so that was cool. I love your mom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, because of that, it didn't occur to me to write anything else because my people did exist. And um, while we lack certain mask representation still, um, I got that in rad books too, which was really nice um, since I didn't have role models who were necessarily women who were masculine of center. Um, so it just seemed natural for me since I wanted to write fiction to write what I knew and what I saw in the world and in myself, but also to expand that out to what it could be. 
That's great. I love that. Okay, uh, we do have a question from the Q&A. Um, it is for Radcliffe, but I'm going to kind of globalize it so everybody can answer. Um, Jamie Harris says to Rad, you have written so many books. So true, Jamie. Most, most of which I have on Audible, also true for me as well. She asks, how do you write? Do you lock yourself in a room until you finish? Do you um, go to writer's retreats? What's your process when you write? My process has changed a little tiny bit over the years. When I first started writing, I was um, a surgery resident and I started writing for many of the reasons that you've heard the other authors mention. I wasn't finding enough books that really um, satisfied my need to see women in love, to see women um, expressing their passion, particularly physically. We were seeing lesbian romances um, in the late 70s and early 80s, but we weren't really seeing a lot of physical intimacy on the page. And that's why I started writing. And as I said, I was a surgery resident at the time. So I would mostly write when I was on vacation and I would write nonstop beginning until end until I finished the book. Once I actually retired from surgery and started the publishing company, I had a lot of day work to do. So I had to find a new way to actually write. And what I discovered in the late 90s, early 2000s was dictating. So I dictate my first draft and I do lock myself in a room, in a quiet room. And I tell everybody I know that I'm dictating, please don't text me. And I stick my phone in the other room and I usually like it to be dark. Um, sometimes I pull the covers over my head and I dictate my draft into a dictaphone and then I connect it to a uh, text to word program on my computer, which then transcribes it for me. And then I edit that and I write when I'm writing, I write about two full chapters a week, which is usually five to 7,000 words. And I will dictate in the morning and edit in the afternoon and the next day. And then I'll dictate the next chapter two days later. And I will not stop until the book is done. I start it on page one and I finish at the end. All right, that's how it's done folks. Nathan, how about you? What's your writing process like? It's gonna sound really chaotic after that. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't write in order. Um, I'm one of those terrible authors you've heard about who uh, often has the final scene come first or a middle scene or something like that. So um, I do have I do have structure around when I write. I tend to write Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays on whatever project has a strict deadline. Um, and then I allow myself to play basically on the other days with something that doesn't have a deadline, almost like a palate cleanser. Um, so mm -hmm. if I get stuck on something, I, I have somewhere else to go. Um, I do use Scrivener, so the fact that I write out of order, I do have sort of a, a three quarters outline sort of tacked along the side of the screen. Um, I will write the scenes that are coming to me at the time, and then my poor editor, Jerry, um, gets to see the first draft where it's got a whole bunch of things that contradict each other, and we have to find all those little mistakes where I put the wrong person in the wrong spot at the wrong time. Um, getting much, much better at that. This is like four or five books in now and I don't know, six or seven novellas. So I, I've, I've certainly cleaned up my act um, from those original first drafts. But if you are the kind of person who doesn't write in order, don't worry, there, there, there are a few of us out there and uh, we still manage to get a completed product, I promise. <laughs> awesome. Ashley, how about you? What's your writing process like? So I am much more like Nathan, um, but I also have ADHD, which makes things like focusing really fun. Um, I can't stick to a schedule. I work on a reward based system. Um, sometimes that means I get to go work out. Sometimes that means I get to get a glass of water. Sometimes that means that I get to watch a television show. Um, but it could also mean like today you get to shower and <laughs> It's just about like managing my own uh, desire to do something other than sit still. And I also write across devices. So I use Scrivener now, but in the past I've done pages. So my iPad was connected to my phone, was connected to the computer. So if I were waiting for a meeting to start, I could pull out my phone and write a little bit. And um, I have written in just about every location. The Dirty Sex was written almost entirely in the front seat of my GTI. 
um, in my last semester of City College. Um, I need to move around a lot. And so whatever strikes me at any moment, I take advantage of it. I also have now started to allow myself to skip scenes. If I get bored with something, then I'll move on to the next chapter. So I write mostly in order, but not entirely in order. I'm really fun to live with. I like that. I love it. I didn't hear that. And I didn't hear any of that really. <laughs> the part about not writing in order, I didn't hear that part from yeah. either of these two. All right, Anne, are you the, the type A write in order or the other type that's willy nilly? I'm type A write in order. Um, I, I write out <laughs> I write out my character descriptions. I write out a synopsis of the story um, and the background for each character. And then I go from there, I start out, I start writing from the beginning. I, I don't even know how my stories end until I get to the end. Um, they kind of play out in my head like a movie and I never want to know the ending of a movie. So I just write as I go along. Um, I write as the characters tell me their story and tell me to, to go along. Um, so I'm, I'm very much type A. Um, I do tend to sometimes work on multiple projects at once um, because I, I get lots of characters in my head and if I don't get it down on paper, then um, I, I feel bad because then I lose them. Um, but I, I, I start from A and go all the way to Z. Awesome. Cool, we just had a comment. Good for you, Anne. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our panel is split. So let's, let's keep it nice, guys. Uh, we have a comment in the chat roll. Um, Jamie says that they wish um, there were there was more fiction that included trans characters, um, which is a nice segue into my next question, um, which is as an LGBTQ identified author, how do you feel about authors who do not identify as LGBTQ writing characters who do? Um, so this is the own voices um, debate with the People can write um, whichever characters they want as long as they get it right. How do you guys feel about this? Do you have an opinion one way or the other? Nathan? Um, so I, I think I think there's actually kind of a dovetail to the question. Um, so my only my only worry, I guess, and maybe that's even over, even that's overstating it, is um, queer people are outnumbered. Um, so we we are we are just outnumbered. That's just a fact. Um, so what happens to me that where I, my worry sort of builds up is um, when you said it's, you know, people can write whatever story they want as long as it's good. Um, well, we're also outnumbered in readership. Um, so who decides what's good? Um, and that's, that's, that's where I see the only real problem that creeps in um, with people writing outside their own lane. And, I mean, as a queer author, I, I tend to stick very tightly to my own lane, but I populate a world like the world is. Um, so, you know, my, my main point of view characters are probably always going to be queer guys. Um, but at the same time, just like my life is full of all sorts of queer people, BIPOC people, people with disabilities, so are my books. Um, so of course I'm gonna do my due diligence and do the absolute best I can to, to make characters that are not harmful or hurtful. Um, but when I talk about the, the good problem, there's this, this thing that happens a lot, um, and maybe it's a little different for me coming from the MM world um, or the, the gay romance world where I, I will often bump into things in gay romances or rather MM romances, and there's a lot of overlap between the two that, um, that just sort of um, hit a sour note or, or don't, like, um, random example, I, I read a book recently where the two characters after getting married decide that they're going to go visit one of the characters' homelands, which is Iran, but we're illegal in Iran. Um, so it just, it knocked me right out of the narrative that they didn't even consider their own safety. Um, so th that's the part I worry about when I, when I see a lot of authors writing very outside their own lane is that, you know, there's, there's only so much good research you can do and, and the, um, the narrative around what becomes a good story is still made up majority by people who aren't from that voice. So, th so that's my worry. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Brad, how about you? Do you have any thoughts on this topic? You know, you know I usually have a few thoughts on a few things. Um, I, I have to echo what Nathan said and also add that I think that 
no matter what you write, no matter what genre you write, whether you're writing romance or science fiction or general fiction or erotica, um, the emotional connections, the emotional depth of the characters are often what the readers relate to as well as the storyline. And I think if you don't live it, you can't write it. Um, I think that the best, most authentic works are written by people who live that life. Does that mean that someone else who doesn't have the lived experience can't write an exceptionally good book that speaks to others outside their experience? Um, I think that can happen, but I, at least from what I've seen and what I've read, I don't think it happens a lot. Um, and I think that we are outnumbered, that our voices, it's taken us a, lot, a long time to have our voices recognized, to have our publishing houses and our authors recognized. We still have trouble getting our books into mainstream bookstores. Um, and I think until those things, until that changes, I think that um, we, our efforts um, should be supporting others who share our experiences who are writing these works. That makes a lot of sense. Ashley, how about you? How do you feel about this debate? So I'm going to take the question and change it a little, if that's all right. Um, and I'm going to tell you why I don't write Black main characters. Um, I, shockingly, am not Black. Um, <laughs> I, I know. It's good I told you. Um, because of that, I will never write a first-person narrator who's Black because I don't have the lived experience. And I can research all day and I'm never going to fully understand that. Now, my books have black people and I think it's important that they do, but I'm writing as a white author. So I think I need to make space for uh, black voices and I need to interrogate my own whiteness. And if I want to include people of color in my books my, and my characters are going to interact with them, then I can interrogate my whiteness through that as an author. But no way in hell am I going to take someone else's voice. And I would appreciate it if straight people didn't do the same to us. Okay, fair enough. And would you like to add to Ashley's comment? <laughs> um, I, I think I'm kind of between Ashley and Nathan's. Um, I, I personally, for instance, I wouldn't write uh, male male romances because I'm not a man <laughs> and I wouldn't know in what perspective, you know, to be able to write that in. Um, like Ashley said, you can do all the research you want, um, but it's still not gonna come out genuine. Um, I don't think a, a, a straight or hetero person is going to understand how to write the story as a lived experience and it's not going to be genuine. I'm not saying they shouldn't write it. If they want, if that's what they want to write, then they can write that. Um, but I don't think it's going to come off as genuine um, as if it was a LGBTQ person writing an LGBTQ story. Um, it's it's the reason I write African American characters is because I am an African American queer woman, so my characters are going to be um, queer characters of color. Um, I have written a trans character um, in an upcoming um, novel. And, but she is a helpful side character. She's not someone whose story that I can really delve into like deeply because I haven't lived that experience. So that's my thought. I, I think if you, if you don't live the experience, I think it's gonna be difficult for your story to be genuine. For sure. And I think your comment about, and, um everyone else too, who were saying that they write secondary characters um, or other people in their books who aren't exactly like them can be a helpful way to, um, to show and to elevate those um, types of characters and those communities as well. Because if we take the um, notion that people from those communities may not have the platform that we have because of whatever privilege that we have, um, we can do a service in that way, I think, without writing their stories, particularly. Um, and to Jamie, who asked about trans books, uh, we do have a bunch on our 2021 schedule. 
Um, I recommend Not Broken by Lynn Hemphill, which is a new release out earlier this year. Um, if you know anyone who is writing trans books, we are actively seeking them. So please do send them our way. All right, what other questions do I have for you guys? Um, is there an identity on the LGBTQ spectrum that you haven't written but would like to? Anne? I would like to write a whole, because I did a short story, but I would like to write a story about, uh, in another historical, about a woman having to live as a man in order to be with the woman she loves. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I did a short story for that, but I, I really want to do a whole story um, and, and talk about her life before transforming into uh, a he to be able to be with the woman that she loves. I love that. And that's super popular too with readers. So you should definitely write that one. <laughs> Brad, how about you? Is there a book you haven't written? Because I'm not sure there is. <laughs> Well, you probably know the, well, there are actually a couple. I'd love to write a space opera, um, which I've never done. And I've thought about it, but I, I really like, I love speculative fiction and I like fantasy and I read a lot of it, but I don't think I'm good enough to write it. So I sort of wish I was. Um, so I'm probably not gonna be writing those books. I wish I, I could write, I'll just have to keep reading them. In terms of what I am writing, um, I don't have anything, I don't think about what I'm gonna write. I don't think about anything except what I'm writing at the time. Like Nathan and Anne, I don't write anything else ever while I'm writing something because it interferes with sort of the organic growth of the book that I'm actually writing if I think about any other characters. So I, I don't even know what I'm gonna write next is my answer. <laughs> Could be anything. It probably won't be a space opera. So, so diligent when she's writing the book, but not diligent <laughs> in her planning for the next one. Ashley, how about you? Is there any uh, point on the LGBTQ spectrum that you haven't written but would like to? Well, um, first of all, can I just say, would really like it if you wrote a space opera. Can you please do that, Rad? <laughs> Note my vote. My mom will order it for me. It'll be great. <laughs> Um, I have not written much in the way of trans characters, um, but in my next book, it is a dystopian futuristic novel and gender as we conceive it doesn't exist. And so in a way I'm writing entirely trans characters, but at the same time, I'm not because that's, that's a much broader identity than I am familiar with. Um, so I'm kind of creating it whole cloth. So we'll see how that goes. Um, aside from that, I don't really look at LGBTQIA2SOP and say, oh, I'm missing 2S, first of all, because I am not Native, and so that would not be appropriate for me to write. But it's, it's difficult to say, oh, we're really missing this one point on the spectrum in my work. Um, it doesn't speak to me in the same way. And I think that someone who's ace is probably gonna write something much cooler than what I would write. That's a good point. Nathan, how about you? Is there any point on the spectrum you haven't written but would like to? Um, I think I'm gonna echo Rad's answer and say it's more that I'd like to explore these in different genres that I haven't touched. I, I, I have this vague notion of a cozy mystery series, but again, I, I hold mystery writers in such high regard because those are such complex stories to plot together and I, I don't think I've got the chops for it. Um, but to sort of answer the question and kind of also not answer it, I'm a huge fan of shared worlds. So honestly, the thing that I would love to do would actually be to write a shared or edit, I guess, a shared world anthology where we all share each other's characters, like my mm. primary character is your secondary character, that sort of thing. And then yes, we could totally have the whole um, quilt, quilt bag alphabet and, and it wouldn't feel like I was sort of taking the mic rather, it would be more like we were sort of holding each other up. Um, so that's always something I've wanted to do, um, especially in a spec fix sense, like I feel like, something set in New Orleans with magical realism um, where we all get to play with our own little characters and share each other. I, I would love to do something like that. But again, I don't have the editing chops yet to pull that off. So not yet. Yeah, that sounds cool. It's something, maybe something that would work great online where it's kind of like more in real time and, and fast. Awesome. 
Hey, Sandy, could I just jump in and, and just plug my river series where I actually do have a trans character, a trans team sure. that I've been writing, I think, uh, to book eight at this point. Um, and I, this, I guess, would be an example of someone who's not writing their own voice. And I was very, um, I hope that I've been very careful in creating this character. I know that readers have related to this character in particular. Um, and that's really stretched me. And I happen to be writing A Rivers right now. And his story is not a primary story but it's a strong secondary story. And it's kind of advanced with every book more than I ever thought it really would in response to how readers have responded to it. So there's my plug. <laughs> That's great. And a great example of you know an author that has a platform like yours using it to um, elevate the voices of others. Um, we have one last question, super quick, because we only have a couple of minutes. Um, and I'm going to have Rad Take it. It's a question for our editors. Um, and the question is, what are we looking for in our submissions process? Do we only review completed manuscripts? Do we review writing samples? What is it that we look for? We only review completed manuscripts because we have found that reading short sections of a work really doesn't tell us enough about the strengths of the work. Something may start out really well. A romance may have a good opening. And then we discover that the structure of the romance arc is off or vice versa. There's a slow opening, the characters don't grab, and yet the writing is good. And by the end of the book, we realize this is a good manuscript. It just needs editing. So full manuscript for review. We will take manuscripts that need editing, that need structural editing, um, primarily. If a manuscript has a lot of technical errors, that is far more difficult to edit. Um, in my opinion, I don't, I don't know how Ashley feels about this being an editor, but generally, if the story has strengths, but it needs to be restructured, or a character needs to be developed, that's something an author who has fairly good writing skills can do with guidance. And that's what editors are for. Um, and that's what we do a lot at Bold Strokes. I love that. Let's end with a super quick speed round. No, no. And <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll finish you last, Rad. Um, so we have a new writer who would like to submit their manuscript to Fold Strokes Books. What is one piece of advice that you would give a new writer looking to be published? Give you a second to think. Ashley. Brand. Figure out what your brand is, number one. And make sure then you set up all of your social media to reflect that brand. Mine is Drunken Poonhound. That's not who I am in real life. But, Are you sure? I mean, I've been with my wife since the beginning of BSB, so. When she was 10. Yes, I was 10. <laughs> Nathan, how about you? One piece of advice. Um, follow the instructions. Read the guidelines. Follow the guidelines. Um, it's, it shows the, the publisher that you actually pay attention. Love it. Anne. Uh, keep your ego in check because it's your manuscript's not going to be perfect and there's going to be things that are said that you may not like but just it's for your own good and just to keep your ego in check love it and rad understand what you're writing if you decide to write a mystery understand how a mystery works if you're writing a romance understand what needs to be in a romance to make it work that means you have to think about the genre and it helps to read it so you have a sense of what needs to be in the book Love it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to our amazing Thanks, everybody. Audience. You are great. And I want that background. That's <laughs> awesome. Thank you. But she wants her name in really big letters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much to Sarah Toga Prize. Thanks, I hope yes. you had a great time. Thank you to Steve and Cindy and Ellen and everyone who supported us tonight. Um, as mentioned, the links to our sale books are in the chat roll. If you have any interest and have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you. This is Thank great. You. Good night, everyone. Nice.